Hi everyone, this is You Do Not Understand Kerberos. A few words about me. I am Daniel Lopez Jimenez, commonly known as Atlas. I'm currently working at the company NCC Group as a senior security consultant. And I'm also an associate teacher at Universidad Castilla-La Mancha uh, here at its, uh, in Spain, mostly focusing on Active Directory security. Below you have some conferences, posts and certifications that I currently hold. And if you are interested in my presentations and my slides uh, or videos, all of them are in my webpage atlas.github.io. A little shout out to our club, chromis.club. We have different blog posts. Um, well, I think they are pretty interesting, so I encourage you to go and take a look. And uh, well, the goal of this talk, the goal of this presentation is understanding the basis of Kerberos. Um, if we understand Kerberos, we will know how to use it and also how to abuse it because we will know uh, its weaknesses. So why? Why are we studying Kerberos? Well, because Windows is the most popular operating system nowadays. Active Directory is based on Windows and is used in, uh, in most of the largest organizations. And well, at the end, Kerberos is the main authentication protocol for Active Directory. But not only for this, uh, I wanted to uh, explain not only how Kerberos works, but also why it works the way it does. Uh, this was one of the reasons uh, uh, well, that I wanted to explain, that I wanted to do this, this presentation. Obviously, well, we will have a general overview of the uh, matter, of the protocol, and there might be some mistakes. So if you spot any mistake or if you have any feedback, is very welcome. Okay, so the agenda is quite simple. We have, first of all, a, a brief history of the protocol. Then we will see how MIT <coughs> um, designed Kerberos. In the third section, we will see how Kerberos works in Active Directory. And then we will see some Kerberos abuses, some common ones. So for the history, uh, this all was created in the project Athena from MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So MIT, with this project, wanted to provide uh, students with systematic access to, to computers. Uh, so if you were a student of MIT, uh, you should be able to go to the institute and use any of the computers and work on them, access to your personal data, access to services easily. And well, if the next day you can't use the same computer, you should be able to access the same data and same services in any of the other computers of the institute. Okay. So a system like this will have uh, some core components. For example, uh, it should have a single sign-on authentication, uh, which means that you should be able to access all the services and different things, providing your credentials just one time. So the idea is you uh, authenticate the first time and then in the next eight hours or something like that, you should be able to access different things without providing credentials again and again. Uh, also, another thing that these uh, systems should have is, well, network shares to, uh, to be sharing information between different computers and also naming convention service like DNS. Uh, so you don't need to um, to know every IP address of the network uh, because that is not ideal. So in regards of Kerberos, the single sign-on authentication component from Project Athena resulted in Kerberos. 
the main thing you need to understand is Kerberos is just authentication, not authorization. This means that Kerberos just identifies you within the network. It say, uh, Kerberos says like, you are Daniel, you are in these groups, you have these different attributes, but Kerberos doesn't decide if you have access to this or that service. The services themselves will decide if you have access to them. Okay? Kerberos is just identifying you. So there were different versions uh, from version 1 to version 3. The, it was just for MIT internal use. But then Kerberos version 4, uh, this one, uh, it was used for some commercial products. But uh, the version that nowadays we are using is Kerberos version 5. It's funny because uh, this important protocol was <clears throat> raised in 1993. In, well, that's pretty funny for me. And well, it's today's version, but uh, we should know that it was updated in, in 2005. So for some of the additions that Kerberos version 5 uh, implemented, well, there were some problems in Kerberos version 4 regarding the encryption. Uh, it was using this encryption. But, well, in Kerberos version 5, these problems uh, were addressed because new encryption types were implemented along with different things like cross-realm authentication, protocol extensibility, and also a programming interface for implementing your own Kerberos clients with all the information about the functions and, and different things called GSS API, the Generic Security Service Application Programming Interface. So at some point, Microsoft was interested in Kerberos and, uh, well, they replaced NTLM as the main authentication protocol for domains. Uh, nowadays, Active Directory supports both, but by default, uh, it will try to use Kerberos. So Microsoft took the GSS API and they implemented some Windows specific additions. And well, instead of using the GSS API itself, they implemented the uh, Kerberos as an authentication package, as a security support provider within within Windows. And well, as as we said in 2006, Kerberos was updated and uh, they implemented different things like uh, new encryption times uh, because of the problems that the uh, DES uh, was having at that time. Okay, so how MIT came across with the idea of designing this, this protocol? So the main problem at that time was, uh, well, uh, not only MIT, but also a lot of organizations, they had this situation of having one computer for several different users. Um, well, this is obviously a problem because uh, users need to be sharing the life cycles of the computer, but also uh, if they store all these different users are storing a lot of data within the computer. Well, if the computer crashes or or breaks, all this data is is gone. So this is not ideal. So MIT thought, okay, let's give one computer for each of the students. And we will connect all these computers with a network. So you can share information between them. And well, that's that's pretty good. But still, there is one important issue, which is uh, what happens with information that is replicated between all these computers or software that is replicated between these computers. So for example, uh, imagine that this user one day comes to this computer 
and it's working with his personal data and his stuff. If the next day this computer is being used by other student, he would need to, well, use another computer. As we said, the idea of a system like this is that this user should be able to access the same personal data and services he had on the first computer. So we need something that allows us to access our personal information, but also imagine that we need uh, software in all of these different computers. Uh, installing the same software in all of the computers, it's not, well, it's not ideal. So how can we address this problem? Well, by using servers. We can have one server for personal files, so it doesn't matter what computer you are using, that computer will connect to the personal server, uh, to the file server, sorry, and you will have access to all, all your information. And well, this same approach can be applied to uh, printers, to mail, to software, etc. So at this point, uh, this is all based, by the way, this is all based in a dialogue uh, created by MIT explaining this same topic, uh, the, the design of Kerberos. So at this point, uh, the dialogue is between uh, Euripides and Athena. And Athena is the is the one that is creating this 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 system. So at this point, Euripides says, uh, "Oh, your your system is really nice, but you know what? What's the first thing that I'm going to do when I use your your system?" And Athena says, "What? What? What? What would you? What will you do?" And Euripides says, "I'm going to find out your username, and get my workstation to think." that I'm you. I'm going to find your username and I'm I will impersonate you. And I will access your messages from mail, I will access your personal files, uh, delete them, etc. So Athena says, mm, what the hell, can you do that? And Euripides says, of course, how these services will know uh, who I am. And well, that's the reason uh, um, because we need an authentication protocol. Okay, so we need an, an authentication protocol, but how can we implement it? We might think about using passwords. So if we need to use any service as the, well, in this case, as Charles, we could think, okay, let's just send our username and secret key or password and we can use them well this approach is is nice for little networks like your own house services in your own house that you can create uh, local users for each of the services and and well have different set of credentials for each of the services but um, in a large organization where we have tons of different services, this approach would require <coughs> a password database in each of them. So this is not only a problem of replication because we would have uh, this password database replicated between a lot of different servers. And well, if we needed to change a password, we should, we, we would need to update that record in all of the different uh, servers, but not—it's not only about the uh, replication uh, issue. Uh, imagine that an attacker compromises any of those servers; he will be able to access all the uh, credentials for all the users. So, well. This is not a, a good approach for a system like, like the one we are trying to create. So as we did with personal files and, and printers and that stuff, we could use an authentication server. So instead of having uh, one password database for each of the servers, 
we could have just some authentication servers uh, which will have this password database. So the, the idea with this is we are centralizing all the credentials in one place and um, all the different actors that will be using this, this system will need to, to be authenticated. And this includes not only users like Charles, but also uh, computers like this workstation or servers like this one, or even uh, service accounts, right? Each of them need to be authenticated within the system because we need to know uh, uh, who are them, all right? So in order to do this, in order to uh, you to be able to authenticate, you need some kind of credentials. So in this case, uh, even computers will have credentials. Okay, but how can I access my email messages? So in this case, if Charles wanted to access his, uh, his mail messages, we could think in a system like this that, well, um, for example, we could send our username and our password to the authentication server and the authentication server will look for our name for Charles. Uh, it, will it, it will take the uh, password associated with the user and if the password is the same as the one we sent, uh, we are authenticated. And if we are authenticated, authenticated and we want to use the mail server, the authentication server could send us the password of the mail server. And then we could use that password to access our email, email messages. Well, this is obviously uh, a bad way of doing this. And <laughs> That's the reason of how not to use a service. Because if we have the secret key of the um, mail server, we, will, we not only will be able to access our own email messages, but also the messages for, from any other user. Because having the secret key of someone, and this includes services, means that you can impersonate that principal, you can impersonate that account. Um, if you can impersonate a service, you can do whatever you want within that service. Okay, so this is not a good way to interact with a service. But now, this is where service tickets uh, start to be used. So a service ticket contains, uh, I'm reading, contains your identity encrypted with the services secret key. So imagine that instead of sending our username and password through the network, which is pretty bad, even if we have encrypted communications, um, let's suppose we are sending our username and a piece of data, which is a timestamp, encrypted with our secret key, with the secret key of Charles. In this case, the authentication service is not going to, um, to compare the secret key of the password database with the secret key we sent, because we are not sending any secret key. In this case, what the authentication server will do is it will search for the record of Charles, it will take the secret key stored from Charles and will try to decrypt this timestamp with that secret key. If the authentication server is able to decrypt that timestamp, then it means it is the correct one, right? So this same approach can be used to um, make users 
be able to access services. So if Charles want to use the email service, in this case, the authentication server, when, 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 in, in, when Charles is authenticated, it will send a service ticket to Charles. This service ticket will hold the, the identity of Charles. So if you open this service ticket, you will have uh, the name of the user, Charles, the groups uh, this, this user is member of, uh, different attributes. So it contains the identity of the principal, Charles in this case. And as you can see, it is encrypted with the secret key of the service we are trying to access. So when Charles um, sends this, ser this service ticket to the mail service, the mail service will take his own secret key and will open this service ticket. And then it will be able to read that this ticket is from Charles, the groups uh, that Charles is member of, and all the different attributes. So the service can identify the person that is trying to access uh, to take all the uh, mail messages, right? So Charles is now, um, Charles can access the service without knowing the actual secret key of the service. And the service can identify Charles uh, by decrypting this secret key because it is encrypted with his own, uh, well, secret key. This is a good approach, but we still have um, a big problem. If we needed, if we wanted to interact with other service, we would require again doing this same uh, process. We would need to send our credentials, obtain a service ticket for other service and access that service. If we were to use another one, we would again credentials, service ticket, blah, blah, blah. So we have the problem that this approach require entering our credentials each time we want to access one service. And as we said, we want to be able to access services without entering our credentials uh, a lot of times. So for implementing single sign-on in Kerberos, we use ticket granting tickets, right? TGTs. So in this case, the authentication server now has two different components. The authentication service, which is the component we were using in the previous slides, and a new service called the Ticket Granting Service, the TGS. So these new Ticket Granting Tickets will be encrypted with the secret key of this new service, the TGS. So the idea is we, as Charles, we send our username and a timestamp encrypted with our secret key. This to the authentication service. The authentication service will take the secret key from Charles, uh, from the password database, and will try to decrypt the timestamp. If it succeeds, it means that the key is the correct one. So in this case, the authentication service responds with a TGT, a ticket ranting ticket. This ticket ranting ticket is, as I said, encrypted with the key, the secret key of the TGS, of the ticket ranting service. So, so when Charles wants to use uh, the mail service, he will send his TGT to the TGS and he will ask for access to the mail service. The ticket ranting service will open the TGT with his own secret key. The TGT is more or less the same as a service ticket in the sense that it will hold 
all the identity of Charles. His name, his groups, and attributes. So, if the TGS is able to decrypt the TGT, it means that the TGT um, is correctly encrypted, is correctly, correctly signed. So, if that, if that is the case, the TGS responds with a service ticket for the mail service, which is, as we know, encrypted with the secret key of the mail service. And then we can use that service ticket to access the mail service. And the mail service will decrypt that ticket with his own secret key. So at the end, what are the improvements we made? Thanks to the authentication server, the AES, uh, we have centralized all the secret keys in one place. Thanks to service tickets, we can use services without knowing the password or the secret key of those services. And at the end, thanks to TGTs and thanks to the ticket granting tickets, we can um, ask for access to different um, services without providing our credentials each of the times. Because at the end, uh, if we wanted to access another service instead of the mail service, we could send again our TGT and ask for access to the printer server or the file server. And we'd, uh, we wouldn't need to provide any kind of credentials again because we have our TGT. Okay. <clears throat> so in regards of tickets, we should know that tickets are reusable and renewable. Uh, the thing is within tickets, there is one, um, one particular uh, attribute <clears throat> that, um, well, uh, makes possible that they have an expiration date. Uh, in fact, what they have is a timestamp with the time creation of the ticket and also a lifespan with, well, uh, the maximum hours or days or whatever uh, this will, uh, this ticket will last. So the idea is when you present a ticket to a service, the service will take that ticket, will decrypt the ticket with his own uh, secret key will confirm the expiration that this ticket is not expired thanks to these attributes and then the service will check if the principal that if the, if the person if the user that sent that ticket uh, has privileges to well to use that service because if we try to if we as as Charles tried to access the mail messages of uh, Bob, well, the service can verify that if we are Charles, we should be able only to access Charles messages, not Bob, not Bob messages. All right. But there is still one important thing, one, one important issue. So tickets can be replayed as long as they are not expired because a service cannot determine the ownership of a ticket. So if, if I somehow compromise the uh, Charles computer and I'm able to access his tickets, uh, with this system, I could use his tickets and impersonate him. Right, because the service at the end cannot verify that I'm I'm Charles or not. Okay, so MIT tried to 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 fix, try to address this issue, because how can we prove that a user is the legitimate owner of a ticket? So MIT came with the idea of using authenticators. All right. An authenticator is a structure created by the client that, again, as 
well, as, as tickets do, authentications, authenticators include the identity of the of the person, of the of the user, and also a timestamp and well other things. So the idea is that uh, with authenticators, when a client interacts with a service, uh, in this time we are now sending not only the ticket but also the authenticator, right? We create the authenticator as a client and we send it along with the ticket. So the service, the idea that MIT uh, tried to use for verifying the, verifying the ownership of a ticket is, okay, we send a ticket, an, an authenticator, and when the service obtains this information, uh, the service will try to open both things, uh, to open the ticket and to open the authenticator, and if in both things say say that we are Charles, uh, somehow the ownership is confirmed. Um, well, there are quotes here and <laughs> it's like this because as we know, uh, this doesn't really um, uh, confirm any ownership because if we happen to uh, if we if we are able to as an attacker, if we are able to create authenticators as well, uh, well we can we can also send a ticket and an authenticator, and the service will confirm that we are the person we are saying. So, so well, um, the problem is not fixed at all. Um, well. The idea, uh, we will see this better in in the in the dia in the diagrams right now in the in the pictures, but uh, you should know that authenticators are, as we said, created by the client, and they are encrypted with session keys provided by the authentication server. So the thing is uh, between a uh, when we are interact we, when we want to interact with a service, the authentication server will create a, a new session key, right? And this session key is sent to us along with the ticket requested. So, for example, if we are uh, trying to um, obtain a DGT, right? Uh, the authentication server will send us a TGT along with a new session key. Also, if we want to uh, access one service, we will, we will send our TGT and the authentication server will respond with a service ticket along with a, ser a new session key, right? So these session keys are sent to us along with the ticket. But these session keys are also included within the ticket, the tickets themselves, right? So we receive a session key as a client, but also a ticket that includes that same session key. This is because when we send, uh, when we interact with the service, we will send the ticket plus the authenticator. And the service with his own secret key will decrypt the ticket. Within that ticket, uh, it will be the session key. So the service can obtain that session key and it can use that session key to decrypt the authenticator. And as we said, if the service confirms that the identity of the ticket is the same as the identity of the authenticator, it can somehow confirm the ownership of the ticket. All right. So we can see here that in every TGS, in every AS exchange, we as a, as a user will receive a TGT and a session key. And that session key will be included in the TGT itself. 
Also, in any TGS exchange, when we are uh, asking for service tickets, we will receive a service ticket along with a new session key. And this session key will be included also within the service ticket. So at the end, this protocol, this system we have created will work like this. We are Charles and we want to use our uh, mail service, all right? So first of all, we need to authenticate into the uh, internal network. We will send our username and a timestamp encrypted with our secret key. The authentication service will take our secret key from the password database and will try to decrypt the timestamp. If the decryption is, is okay, then it means that the secret key used is the correct one. In that case, we will receive a TGT encrypted with the secret key of the TGS and a session key, a new session key, encrypted with our secret key. This is because, um, uh, well, this session key should be uh, just <clears throat> for us, right? So it, this one is encrypted with our secret key. We as a user, we will save the TGT for later use and the session key encrypted, we will decrypt it with our secret key, the Charles secret key. All right, so now uh, we want to use the mail service. So we need to ask for a service ticket for that service. As we said, we need to create, as a client, we need to create an authenticator that holds our identity. This authenticator will be encrypted with the previous TGS session key. This authenticator will be sent to the TGS along with the TGT that we had. And we need to ask the TGS that, well, we, we want to access the mail service. The ticket granting service will decrypt the TGT because it is encrypted with its own secret key, it will decrypt that ticket and within that ticket um, it has the session key along with the identity of Charles. It can extract this session key to be used to decrypt the authenticator. If within the authenticator says that uh, the identity is Charles and the TGT says that the identity is Charles, then the TGS says, okay, uh, this is the <laughs> legitimate owner of the TGT. And in that, in that case, uh, the TGS will respond with a service ticket along with a new session key for this new session, uh, in, uh, this new service interaction. All right. This session key in this case will be encrypted with the previous session key, the TGS session key we obtained through the AES exchange. <clears throat> right? So in this case, as we had this previous session key, we can use it to decrypt the new one. And as we want to interact with the mail service, we will create another authenticator encrypted with the new session key. We will send the, the authenticator along with the service ticket to access to our mail service, uh, our, ma our mail messages. And then the mail service will decrypt this ticket because it is encrypted with his key. Within that ticket, uh, it will be the the session key, the second session key, along with the identity of the user, which is Charles. This session key will be used to decrypt the authenticator. And again, if the identity of the authenticator and the service ticket are the same, 
and the, then the ownership of the ticket is confirmed by the service. All right, there is one last optional exchange where the, um, the service responds to the user with a timestamp encrypted with that uh, last session key. In this case, we take as a user, we take the timestamp and we can decrypt it with the session key. Uh, what this means is if we can decrypt it properly, this means that the service, the server, the mail server, was able to decrypt the service ticket and thus was able to uh, obtain this session key. So with this, there is some kind of mutual authentication because the service knows we are Charles because uh, it has decrypted our service ticket properly and then decrypted the timestamp and in both of them said, said that we are Charles. But we also confirmed that the mail service is the legitimate one because it was able to decrypt the service ticket and obtain our mutual session key, right? So that's pretty much it about the designed design of Kerberos by MIT. So now talking, we, uh, talking about Kerberos in Active Directory, we will start with some uh, details and some differences between the MIT Kerberos. So first of all, <clears throat> we need to know that all the all Kerberos components, actors, all Kerberos systems, they need to be synchronized in regards of uh, the time. Because otherwise, if all the systems uh, didn't have uh, the same time, we couldn't um, we couldn't use ticket expirations and timestamps properly uh, because, well, if each of the systems has different <laughs> times, uh, this is not reliable. Then uh, Kerberos, uh, the, the, the Kerberos service uh, uses the port uh, 1880 and both TCP and UDP, okay? Uh, it normally uses TCP. We, most of the time we will be using TCP because as far as I know, there are some Kerberos extensions that uh, doesn't even work in UDP. But, well, UDP is there for any etched uh, cases. So, so it should. Uh, it is interesting to know that it's also listening in UDP. And also, uh, Kerberos does not normally work with IP addresses, right? When you configure uh, Kerberos services, uh, most of the times you are using DNS names. Uh, for example, mailserver.capsule.corp. Okay, but. Uh, you should know that in recent versions of Windows, yeah, you are able to to implement IPs uh, in order to Kerberos be able to support uh, access to to well using IPs. Okay, so as we said, there are components that differ from uh, the MIT. Uh, names and, and these ones from Active Directory. So if we remember, we had something like this, the authentication server, the server and a workstation. So the first thing uh, we need to know is there will always be a realm a domain. In this case, it's capsule.corp. This is like uh, uh, what places, uh, what's inside the trust, our what's inside our internal trust ne network, and what is not, right? Uh, well, you can see here our example with capsule.corp. 
The authentication server is called domain controller in Active Directory environments, and also the password DB is called NTDS, right? These two components, the AES and the TGS, uh, are called uh, are part of something called Key Distribution Center, the KDC. Okay, and as we mentioned before, um, every Kerberos actor, every uh, computer, every user account or service accounts uh, will need, will have credentials, will have secret key, secret keys, because uh, each of them, they are principles within this, <coughs> this domain, right? We can see the DC01 uh, with the dollar, Charles main service, all of them are principles. And most of them are server in this slide. And not only the mail server is a server, uh, but also computers. And also uh, in some times, in some situations, um, user accounts can be, can offer services, right? Uh, this is because, well, each Windows system if you uh, join one computer to uh, an Active Directory domain, it will register most of the uh, services to be able to uh, support Kerberos. So for example, uh, most <coughs> of the uh, Windows computers will have the SMV service for uh, network shares, which in uh, Microsoft uh, implementation of SMBs, SIFs, right? And well, the domain controller has these services, but also usually has a DNS service. And well, the thing is, most of the computers are servers within Active Directory, not only the actual uh, explicit servers, all right? So in regards of services, um, you can register services for Kerberos with an attribute called service principal name, SPN, right? So user accounts and, and computer accounts, they have this, this attribute and you can uh, register new, new services in, in this attribute with this syntax. This is, well, this syntax, syntax consists of first, the name of the service we are offering, for example, DNS, and then the host serving that service, in this case, dc01capsule.corp. So, well, dc01 should be offering DNS in this case, okay? So when you want, uh, we, we didn't see this in, in all the uh, animations, uh, we saw, but when we were talking with the authentication server, with the ticket granting service, in fact, we were saying, uh, okay, I want to access the mail service. Uh, that is actually, uh, we are sending in the request, we are sending actually the SPN, the service principal name of the mail service uh, in that request when we are trying to obtain a service ticket for the mail service, okay? And you should know that for AES exchanges, the ones that we uh, obtain the TGT, the SPN will always be the KRV TGT one, and the host will be a domain controller, okay? For example, <clears throat> we see here W, the workstation 01, it has the, the attribute service principal name where we can see it's serving different services. For, for example, host is a group of different services such as um, SMB, as we said, the SIFs. And well, we have here another one, WSMAN, which allows you to, to use um, things like uh, PowerShell remoting, etc. 
So we can see here different services that might be offered by these different servers. If, for example, the mail service could be offered by server 01 or could be offered by a service account uh, called mail service, depending on how you configure this. Okay. And also, we didn't say the actual names of the messages we were using before, but well, this these are the names. When you try to access a TGT, when you are sending the timestamp and your name, this is the AS, the authentication service request. The authentication service will respond with a TGT and a session key with the AS response. When we send our TGT <coughs> along with an authenticator, we will be doing the TGS request for requesting service ticket for any service. And the TGS will respond with the service ticket and a new session key with the TGS response. At the end, when we have our service ticket, we will be using the AP request uh, to send that service ticket along with another authenticator. And the optional one we set where the service response with a timestamp encrypted with the second session key is called AP response. So now <clears throat> we are going to see all these different messages because it's always nice uh, viewing the theory, but um, it's always better to confirm this theory by checking the actual messages, for example, with Wireshark. So let's imagine we are authenticating as Vegeta. All right, we are putting our username and our password. What it will happen uh, when we see Wireshark is something like this. <clears throat> we can see a first AS request, an error stating that pre-authentication is required, a second, a second AS request, a AS response, which should have a TGT, a TGS request and a TGS response, response, which should have a service ticket. So first of all, why is this error happening? Well, is this is because Windows, by default, the first thing, uh, even if you provide uh, with your password when logging in, the first thing Windows will do is sending just is just sending your, your username to the authentication service. The authentication service, um, well, just with your username, it will respond, please give me pre-authentication. Because at the end of the day, uh, the timestamp encrypted with our secret key is called pre-authentication. So uh, by default, all the users require pre-authentication when interacting, when trying to, to obtain a TGT. Okay. So in this case, we are sending our username and our, the timestamp encrypted with our secret key. This is the second AES request. And if we inspect this AES request, we will see that, uh, well, there is our timestamp here in something called PA data, pre-authentication data, within the AS request Kerber Kerberos message. And well, also we can see here the, the version of Kerberos used, which is five. And well, this is the most important things. So, as we know, the timestamp, um, the authentication server will take our secret key from the database and will try to decrypt the timestamp. If the decryption is correct, 
we know that the secret key is the correct one. So in that case, the authentication server, the domain controller, sorry, responds with a TGT of our user and a session key encrypted with the uh, secret key of Charles. We can see this in the <clears throat> in the actual message. This is an AS response. We can see it here. We can see that the realm is capsule.corp. We can see that uh, the principal doing this is Vegeta. And here we have the ticket that some of the attributes are in plain text. We can, we can see it. We can see that the realm is capsule.corp. We can see that the service we are interacting with is a, a TGT1 in capsule.corp. This is in fact the SPN, right? We see the, the service, KRV TGT slash, uh, it would be a slash in the SPN format, and the capsule.corp, all right? And within the encoded, uh, well, encoded not, the encrypted part here, we will have something like this, uh, a cipher, a, a large string, which will be the, uh, the actual encrypted information of the ticket, right? In this case, as it is a TGT, this encrypted part will be encrypted with the TGS um, secret key. In regards of the session key, the second encrypted part will have the session key encrypted with the user's secret key. Okay. Well, we have here the information that a TGT has. If you configure uh, Wireshark with the secret key of um, the ticket granting service, you will be able to decrypt uh, TGTs. So as we said, <coughs> in the encrypted part of a TGT, we will have different things. For example, the expiration times, we will have, um, most importantly, well, we have the decay, decision key, we have the logon information, and uh, within this, we have the uh, something called uh, the PAC, PAC, with all the relevant information about the user. We have here information about the logon times, information about the password, and the name of the account, uh, attributes of this account, uh, the groups that is member of, etc. This is a TGT. So when we receive this information, the TGT and the uh, session key, we know we will be decrypting the session key because it is encrypted with our secret key. And we will create an authenticator with, uh, with that session key. Um, in the TGS request, we will be sending those two things. In this case, when you log on in a computer, in an, in an Active Directory computer, uh, Windows will do a TGS request by default for the host service, all right? In this case, we are authenticated, authenticating into the workstation 01. So we see that the TGS request is for the host service uh, of the workstation 01 server or workstation, right? Uh, well, we can see here that this is a TGS request message, but within that message, we see there is one AP request uh, message as well. This is because we are interacting with a service, which is the ticket granting service uh, service. All right, the TGS service. So that's that's why there is an AP request there. <clears throat> um, 
well, we can see here that we are sending the ticket, our TGT, and the authenticator we just created for, for this interaction. We can see here what's inside an authenticator. Uh, again, if we configure uh, Wireshark to be able to decrypt this information, we can access it. So in this case, we, we see that this authenticator is well encrypted with AS256. Uh, this is the cipher, this is the string that uh, well uh, has the encrypted information. So if we decrypt it, we can access uh, the information below. The realm that we are using, uh, the identity of the person, which is Vegeta, and the timestamp, we can see it here. Also a different checksums and other information, right? But we know that the main reason for using authenticators is providing a second way of confirming the identity of the of the <clears throat> of the user. So when the when the ticket ranging service obtain this, we know that it will open the TGT, extract the session key, and decrypt the authenticator and confirm the ownership of the TGT. In that case, it will uh, send us a service ticket for the service we requested, which is the host service, and uh, a session key encrypted with the previous session key. We can see this here, TGS re response, uh, Vigita, and <clears throat> here is the service ticket for the host service, and the encrypted part below uh, will hold the session key encrypted with the previous session key. But, well, the example with the host service is uh, a bit, um, well, I don't like that example. So let's imagine we, when we are authenticated as Vegeta, we try to list the contents of the C$ directory of workstation 02. We can see that the CMD response access is denied, right? Uh, this is, uh, I use this example because we need to remember that uh, Kerberos is just authentication, not authorization. So it doesn't matter that we are denied access, uh, Kerberos will still provide us with a service ticket for that service, right? So when we do this, Wireshark will show this, a TGS request, TGS response, and then two different um, messages uh, for the SMB protocol, a request and a response. Uh, what we are doing is, uh, well, requesting a new service ticket with the previous TGT we had for the CIFS uh, service, which if we remember, is the service that <coughs> is the, impl the implementation, the SMB implementation that Microsoft did. All right. So, well, this is the service ticket. And below we have the another new session key for this service interaction, which is encrypted with the first session key we obtained when we, uh, when we obtained the TGT. Okay, what we will see is that within a service ticket, we will have um, the same, mostly the same information as a TGT, but instead of the uh, KRV TGT service, we will see, well, another service, in this case, SIFS from uh, the Workstation 02 server. Authentication times and also the uh, Log on information with <clears throat> the name of the principal, attributes, etc. So, well, as we know, when we receive this service ticket and this session key, we will decrypt 
the session key with our TGS session key, the first one that we obtained when when requesting the TGT. Okay. And since we want to interact with a, a folder, a shared folder of workstation 02, we need to create another authenticator encrypted with this new session key. And we will send this, the service ticket and the authenticator. So this is the AP request. In this case, since we are using SMB, all the information, all the Kerberos security information will be included within the SMB message. Specifically, we can see the security blob, a reference to the GSS API. Uh, well, we, we go below a Curve 5 blob and then a, an AP request. We can see in the AP options, uh, the mutual required flag is activated. Uh, this will, well, we will see that the server will respond to us with the AP response because of this flag. Otherwise, if this is zero, uh, the server will not send the AP response. Okay. And then we, we see the ticket, the service ticket, the CIFS service ticket and the authenticator. So at the end, uh, what happened is workstation 02 decrypted the service ticket. It took all the security information about Charles. Uh, it took also the session key <coughs> and decrypted authentication authenticator. Even if the authenticator and the service ticket say that uh, Charles is identity. Well, Charles, in fact, didn't have any privileges to list the C$ dollar share of Workstation 02. So it doesn't matter that Charles has a service ticket or an authenticator, the service will deny access to Charles. So in this particular case, as we know, because of the uh, mutual authentication flag, this service will respond with a timestamp encrypted with uh, the session key. This can be seen here in the AP response, where we see, well, the cipher, the string encrypted, where uh, within that we would see uh, the timestamp. Okay, so at the end we can confirm that. Uh, the server, the workstation 02 server, is the legitimate one, even though uh, it doesn't provide us access because we, we, th we don't have enough privileges. And that's pretty much it. So there is some notes uh, before finalizing this section. The first one is if you want to configure Wireshark for decrypting um, TGTs or service tickets, authentication, authenticators, etc., you can configure a kitab file within Wireshark. And well, you have an example of kitab creation here with KTUtil. Uh, obviously, if the <coughs> TGT you want to decrypt is encrypted with AS256, uh, well, you should obviously create the, the kitab with that information. Okay, so now let's see some Kerberos abuses. We will see two different sections. The first one is credential access, where we see how can we enumerate users or guest passwords with Kerberos and also uh, something called roasting. And then the second section is how we are able to replay tickets, even though uh, authenticators and session keys exist. How can we forge Kerberos tickets? 
and a Kerberos delegation, which is which will be explained in a future presentation because uh, it has a lot of information and well, I don't have enough time for this for this video for explaining that. So for credential access, first of all, Kerberos is susceptible for user enumeration. You can use AS request messages for enumerating users because when you send one uh, AS request message saying uh, a username that doesn't exist, the authentication service responds uh, stating that it doesn't really know uh, that principle. We can see that error here with the get TGT example from Impacket. You can see that capsule.corp wrong user doesn't exist and the KDC responds with a principal unknown error. This is the um, traffic seen in Warsark. And um, one really interesting um, tool for enumerating users uh, with Kerberos is Kerberoot from Ronnie Flathers. Uh, I encourage you um, taking a look to this awesome presentation found with LDAP and Kerberos from this guy because it is really, really good. So with Kerberoot, we can specify the function user num and we can provide a word list of uh, different users, usernames. And well, Kerberos is pretty fast for confirm confirming these usernames because at the end we are just sending one request per, per username. So we see here there are two valid usernames, Vegeta and Yamcha, and four invalid, uh, Dale Cooper, Tony Soprano, Spiderman, and Jimmy McNulty. So that's it for user enumeration, but we also can brute force credentials with Kerberos. <clears throat> we can use AES request pre-authentication messages. And the good thing about this um, in a, an offensive perspective is we will not be raising um, authentication failure events by default. Because uh, this pre-authentication um, uh, failures will not trigger the typical uh, 4625 uh, event, uh, an account failed to log on, because this raise another one that's called Kerberos pre-authentication failure. And this one is not enabled by default. Okay. So if you are trying to <clears throat> to guess passwords with Kerberos, uh, just be aware of the Active Directory lockout policy. So the best approach for these things is usually performing a password spraying instead of sending lots of different passwords for the same user, right? So in this case, what we are doing is we are not Charles. And we are saying we are Charles with a timestamp encrypted with an arbitrary password. The authentication service will try to decrypt that timestamp with the secret key of Charles. And if it's not able to do, do, to do so, um, well, it will respond with a message of pre-authentication wrong. We can see an example here. Pre-authentication failed for Yamcha. And this is the, um, the traffic generated. As we said, um, there will be counts of these failures in AD. So take care, uh, watch out uh, doing brute forces for the same user because you, you might block it. And again, Kerberoot is a really nice tool for, <clears throat> for brute forcing or for doing password spries uh, through Kerberos. We can see here an example with a word list of just four users. 
using the password uh, patata123. And we can see four different valid logins. So that's it for the password guessing part. And now we have a section called roasting. <clears throat> so we know Kerberos changes uh, in all of these mes messages we we were seeing. We've been using different secret keys for different things. Okay, so for example, we in the first AS request with pre authentication, we were encrypting a timestamp with our secret key. The AS response we obtain when we authenticate properly into the domain will have a session key encrypted with the user's uh, secret key and also. Um, Service tickets, we know they are encrypted with the um, secret key of the service that are uh, uh, that that service ticket will be used to to access. Okay, so if we happen to uh, obtain one of these uh, Kerberos messages, we will be able to um, obtain this any of these pieces and we could try to crack them okay so we have the as rick roasting as rep roasting and tgs rep roasting which is commonly called as kerber roasting <clears throat> so please take note um, that there are different encryption types within kerberos so if um, if you are capturing one message from the network somehow, uh, you will be seeing probably AS encryption, which is quite uh, strong as opposed to, for example, RC4. Okay, but if you if you happen to uh, be able to force one uh, message uh, by yourself you can try to downgrade the encryption by saying, hey, I only support RC4. And well, the, all the exchange will be, uh, will be done through that encryption type, okay? So in the case of ASREC roasting, ASREC roasting, uh, we know that AS requests with pre-authentication data they have this timestamp encrypted with the user's uh, secret key. So if we obtain one of these message, uh, one of these messages uh, from other user, we can try to crack this timestamp uh, offline. Okay. So if the user has a really bad password. Obviously, the timestamp will be encrypted with that really bad password. Here we can see one of these messages. As, as we saw earlier in the uh, PA encrypted timestamp section of the message, we can see uh, this PA uh, pre authentication data value. With the encryption type, with this, uh, which is AS256, uh, which is the encryption type 18, and the cipher uh, that is, well, the actual encrypted string with the information. So for John, John the Reaper, we have, we are able to <coughs> provide uh, this. This, we, we, we can crack this kind of uh, strings, this kind of encrypted messages with this format, right? We need to specify the principal name, in this case is Vegeta, the realm, which is capsule.corp, the salt, we, which we will be talking about it in a moment, and the cipher bytes. Uh, that we will copy from here, right? 
and it's here in yellow so for the salt uh, we need to interact with the KDC to obtain the information All right here's Clement Notin um, asking for well this this thing thanks for sharing is this salt stored in a public LDAP attribute and well Benjamin responded nope you mo you must request and fail so in this case uh, I've seen that uh, you don't necessarily need to fa um, request and fail you can just request <clears throat> and in the response we will see one section where this salt will be exposed all right so it's capsule.corp vegeta capsule.corp vegeta so now we can um, specify this to john and we can try to crack it which is in this case cracked with the password uh, patatas123 okay so for as rep roasting as response roasting we know these messages of, uh, include a tgt encrypted with the ticket Ranty service secret key but also a session key encrypted with the user secret key okay so in this case if we happen to obtain access to any of these messages from other users we can try to crack the session key to try to uh, um, well obtain the clear text password of the user again if the user is using a, a, a really bad password this session key will be encrypted with that same password so in this case we have another example with an AS response uh, the session key is within the encrypted part here below and again is encrypted with AS and the format is like this the salt the first bytes and the last 12 bytes so well we can see here we can copy this a string and we can adapt it to this format in this case we are using uh, Yamcha so well it's the approach is pretty much the same so we can <coughs> uh, use John again and and crack this session key to obtain the clear text password of uh, of Yamcha in this case okay um well usually uh, as rep roasting is explained in on the internet uh, by explaining that well active directory usually well not usually active directory has an user account control setting called do not require Kerberos pro authentication okay so what this setting does is uh, that you can obtain a TGT and uh, an encrypted session key for any user without providing any kind of pre-authentication okay so the idea is if for example Bulma has the do not require Kerberos pre-authentication setting enabled we uh, as Charles or, or as any user or even as an, an authenticated user right we can say hey I'm Bulma and the authentication service will respond us with a TGT and the session key encrypted with the user's secret key which in this case is Bulma's secret key as we know uh, we can't use this TGT alone because we need to create an authenticator with the encrypted with the session key so we can't use this TGT but we can try to crack 
this session key. And that's that's the thing of, of this attack. So as always, if the user has a really bad password, the session key will have a really bad password. So the advantage of this attack over uh, trying to uh, sniff from the network, which is quite hard uh, because of the use of switches and, and and different things, it's not it's not that easy to um, sniff this kind of traffic. So the the idea of this attack is uh, as you are forcing the the message as other user, you can downgrade the encryption as we as we said. In this case, we can see the encryption type is twenty three, which is RC four. And the format for RC4 in this case is, well, this one, principal name, um, Bulma, the first 16 bytes, and then the remaining bytes. So, well, here we can see how we were able to, to crack this one as well. And that's it for AS rebroasting. Okay. And well, finally, TGS reprosting. This is the most important one. We, <clears throat> if if we know something about AD attacks or or common things like that, um, we probably know that Kerberosting is was one of the most common and most successful attacks for Active Directory environments, because as we should know. Uh, in this moment, after so many slides, as an authenticated user, we should have access to a TGT, our ticket oriented ticket, for requesting access to services. And we should be able to request a service ticket for any service, even those that we don't have access at all. So we should know that these tickets are encrypted with the secret key of the service to which it uh, to which are um, targeted. So, for example, the TGT is targeted uh, to the ticket granting service. Okay, so that's why TGTs are encrypted with the secret key of the ticket granting service. And a service ticket for the mail service will be encrypted with the secret key of the mail service. So why don't we try to crack these tickets? Well, that's the that's the reason for this attack. We have the TGT, which is encrypted with this key, and service tickets with, which are encrypted with uh, these red keys. So for the black, uh, for the white one, we should know that the ticket granting service is run by a service account called KRV, uh, KRV TGT. Okay. So this service is effectively running with this account. So TGTs are encrypted with the secret key of the KRV. TGT. KRV TGT uh, service account. This the password, the secret key of this account should be really, really big because it's managed be uh, managed by by Active Directory. It's not configured by uh, an administrator by default, so it should not be crackable. But as always, uh, sometimes. The reality surpass the uh, uh, well. The thing is uh, here in this tweet, Andrew Robbins <coughs> um, detected that uh, he could be able to crack one KRV TGT account password because well, uh, an administrator or an attacker uh, changed that secret key and well uh, someone placed a weak secret key a weak password for that account and 
it could be it could be cracked okay so we can see here this 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 account the KRB TGT and well in the text in the description we see key distribution center service account and in the service principal name name we can see the K admin change password okay so if we remember all the TGTs will be using the SPN KRV TGT with uh, the domain capsule.corp or <clears throat> the name of a domain controller. Okay. So that's it for the um, the TGTs. But in fact, when we are talking about Kerber hosting, the secret key that it's used is the secret key of the targeted service. If this service is the mail service, then it's the secret key of the mail service. Okay, and the mail service can be run as a computer account or as a service account. Okay. Well, in our examples, this is the service. So you should know that domain services are normally run, as, as I said, by computer accounts or service accounts. An example of service account that is running a service, we have the KRV TGT account that we just uh, saw. And for computer accounts, um, well, the host SPN, uh, SMB, RDP, uh, or the service that um, allows using things like PowerShell remoting, these services uh, are normally offered by uh, computer accounts. Okay, for example, the DNS service is offered by domain controllers by default using their domain computer account. Okay, so as of computer accounts, it happens like the KRV TGT service account. Uh, their passwords are managed by Active Directory, so they they are really big and they shouldn't be uh, crackable. But as of service accounts, they are often managed by administrators, by, by humans. So, well, this is commonly known as resting pepperoni because if a human is setting passwords, we know what usually happens. So we see here an example of creating a service account. Um, we can call it mail service. We can configure a service principal name for it, mail service for the mail server dot capsule dot, dot corp. We can see here some attributes of this service account. Service principal name is here. And well, if we <coughs> we configured a bad and weak password for this one, we will know we know that any service ticket that is aimed to that uh, service will be encrypted with that weak password. So the idea of Kerber hosting is uh, as we can ask for any service ticket for any service within the domain, even if we don't have um, privileges for those services. So the idea is, okay, uh, give me a service ticket for each of those service accounts that might be created by administrators. And let's try to crack them. So here we see an example with the get users SPNs example in packet example uh, with the request flag we can request <coughs> a service ticket for them and uh, this example gives us a hascat format a hascat has format for for those tickets we see here how are we sending different TGS requ requests for each of those tickets. And well, um, we could we could do this uh, manually 
as with the others by well in this case as we are using get user SPNs uh, by default it's downgrading the encryption to RC4 20, 23 so we just need to copy uh, the format with the encryption type, the user main realm, the SPN, the first 16 bytes and the remaining ticket bytes. So we could do this manually, but as we said, um, this example gives us the proper hashes for Haskat. So we have here an example of, <clears throat> of cracking uh, this, these hashes. We have six out of six uh, decrypted or cracked, but and we should know that Haskat has support for other encryption types like uh, eighteen or or seventeen. Okay. So one thing should you should really understand about this is uh, well, I often see that uh, people crack service a service ticket and obtain the password of a, a service account and they just look for oh is this service account a member of the domain administrator group and if it's not a member of the uh, domain administrator or if it if it doesn't have any explicit privilege they say oh then it's a useless service account well you should remember that the secret key of these services, the secret key of the service account you just cracked, is used to encrypt tickets for that service that is offering. So the the thing is you can forge or you can modify any service ticket that is aimed to the service that is offering that service account. This is commonly known when you forge service tickets with the secret key of a, of a service. This is commonly known as sil silver tickets. So the thing is, if you crack the password of a service account, you can control the service that service account is offering. This means if you crack the service account of a SQL server, you can impersonate any user on that SQL server, even uh, database admins that maybe uh, allowed could allow you to execute things like XP CMD cell or things like that. For the mail service, you could you could impersonate other users and obtain their their messages. Or for file servers, you can. You could impersonate other users and access their their personal files. So please remember that that you are not you are not uh, obtaining a service account just for checking uh, its uh, groups or its explicit um, privileges, but uh, that you could be anyone in the service that it's offering. So for finalizing this presentation, we will see some user impersonation attacks for Kerberos. Uh, as we know, <clears throat> if we have the secret key of a user, well, we should know already that we should be able to obtain a TGT of that user. Uh, if we have, if we have the plain text password of a user or if we, if we have the NTLM has or AS secret keys, we should be able to obtain a TGT from that user with an AS request. And then we could, we could use that TGT to obtain service tickets. And then with those service tickets, we could try to access services. Okay. We see here that, well, if we have the password of a user, Rubius has um, a function named has, uh, that if we provide the password, the user and the domain, it can 
provide you with the NTLM has and the, <coughs> the AS keys, etc. So here you can see we can obtain a TGT uh, with each of the methods that we see, we saw, uh, for example, with the password in clear text, with the NTLM has, uh, and also with the one of the AS keys. In all of these examples, we are obtaining a TGT along with a session key. Okay. But also, if you happen to obtain access to a TGT and its associated session key, we can use it to obtain service tickets and then use those service tickets to access services as the, as the victim. Okay, in this case, uh, imagine we obtained a TGT from Yamcha. So in this case, we can, a TGT and a session key, sorry. So in this case, we can use that to, um, well, in this case, we are asking access with that TGT to the CIFS service of the domain controller 01, and we can, well, we can access SysVol as Yamcha with that TGT and session key. And at the end, if you have access to a service ticket along with the session key of that ticket, you can try to access the targeted service. So imagine we have <coughs> a service ticket for SIFs uh, of the domain controller along with the session key of that interaction. We can use it to, again, list the SysVolter of the domain controller. That's it for the ticket replaying. So for uh, lastly, we have the forged Kerberos tickets. So as we said, tickets are encrypted with the secret key of the service to whom they are targeted. So if we know uh, the secret key that is used to encrypt those tickets, we can either create our own tickets or even modify legitimate ones. Okay. So the idea here is uh, when you create a, when you forge a ticket granting ticket, a TGT, it is commonly known as golden tickets. So as we know for TGTs, they are encrypted with the secret key of the ticket granting service. And this service is run by the KRV TGT service account. So if you obtain the secret key of the KRV TGT service account, you can create um, golden tickets. So here we have compromised a domain controller and with Mimikatz we extracted one of these secret keys of this account, for example, the NTLM has. So here with Ticketer.py, another example of Impacket, we can use that NTLM has to create a new ticket ranting ticket as anyone, even invalid users like Spiderman. And we can use that new Ford golden ticket to, well, uh, by default, <coughs> in packet includes you as a domain administrator. So you can, well, you can run, for example, psxec to create a remote service and access the domain controller. And for silver tickets, it's pretty much the same approach, but using, uh, instead of the KRV TGT, uh, we are using the secret key of the, the targeted service. So <clears throat> for, well, remember that servi services are offered by computers and service accounts. So if a service is offered by a computer, we need to extract the secret key of that computer in order to create silver tickets. And for service accounts, we need to obtain the secret key of, of the service account. Okay. So here we see that the 
one of the secret keys of the domain controller 01 is this one, the NTLM has. So we can use that NTLM has to create a silver ticket for the SIFS service. So again, with this uh, service ticket, we will be able to run PSXEC because at the end of the day, PSXEC uses, a, a creates a remote service on the target and it does this by interacting uh, with the thieves service. All right. And well, for Kerberos delegation, um, as I said, um, we will have, I don't know when, but we will have another presentation uh, explaining all the different uh, delegations and constraint, constraint and, and resource-based constraint delegation. So that's pretty much it. I hope you, you have enjoyed the presentation. Uh, apologies if my English is not good enough in some parts of the explanation. Um, well, it was quite hard explaining everything in Spanish. So <laughs> in English is a, a really good challenge for me. So anyways, I really hope you, you have enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.